So good evening and welcome to tonight's program. Tonight, we're gonna to be joined by a wonderful group of individuals that are gonna present on neurodiverse couples. So I would like to just take a few minutes to kind of introduce some of the, the talking points that we'll be sharing tonight. Just as a reminder, this is a webinar and so people will be muted, but we want you to place in the chat any questions you have or if you want to engage in the chat otherwise. We are joined tonight by Cheryl Rhodes, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist and a certified neurodiverse couples therapist. She is an experienced mental health practitioner and support group leader who has worked with families and individuals with autism and developmental disabilities for over 30 years. We also have Amanda Platner, who is the director of adult programs at the Emory Autism Center, as well as an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Emory University School of Medicine. She's a clinical psychologist, and so Dr. Platner specializes in working with individuals and families impacted by neurodevelopmental disorders, and is particularly interested in intervention assessment, as well as working with individuals who have comorbid medical and or mental health conditions. We are also joined here by Stephanie D'Souza, who is a seasoned mental health practitioner, educator, neurodiverse coach, and consultant who cares deeply about supporting those who think and experience the world in unique ways. She has her master's degree in clinical social work, as well as a certificate as a neurodiverse couples coach. Ms. D'Souza is passionate about aiding individuals who are neurodivergent and looks to partner with clients to build to their strengths and work through challenges. We also have our two neurodiverse couples that we are joined to tonight here with Anne Marie and Mike and the Bostons. And so I want to welcome everyone to tonight's program. And if you have any questions, you can click chat at the bottom of your screen and you are muted. So you don't have to worry about any background noise that we may hear tonight. I will turn it over to our panelists. Okay, hey, I'm going to get started. Um, Stephanie D'Souza, just sharing my screen here. Really excited to be here and talk about a topic that I enjoy. Sorry, Stephanie, to interrupt. While Stephanie's getting started, if anyone has questions or comments in the chat, um, I think I can, I'll be able to answer them um, or at least flag them for Stephanie to answer when she's done. Um, so again, the topic tonight is really about neurodiverse couples counseling and, and what that means. Um, my focus tonight is going to be speaking from the perspective of a clinician. Um, what, who may come to see me, um, what their prior experience may be with therapy and, and counseling. There we go. So what is neurodivergent, right? It's just kind of what does it entail? Um, so it describes people whose brains may work differently in unexpected ways according to societal norms. I don't even like to say that, but just to give it a framework, right? What are some differences that individuals who identify as neurodivergent may experience? So they could be learning differently. They could be processing information differently, auditory processing, visual processing. Um, they could be interpreting social situations differently and reacting to interactions, um, comments, things happening in the world, again, differently than, than maybe a neurotypical individual would. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, and they're just expressing their emotions and communication can also be um, just different, right? Not bad, just different. And that's what we really want to want to stress tonight. So what are some strengths that neurodivergent individuals have? I think it's really important to focus on those. And as a neurodivergent coach and as therapists in this community, we really do want to pull on strengths and identify those and help use those strengths, right, to, to work with couples. So that could be excellent memory, um, elevated productivity, typically higher than average intelligence, they're creative thinkers, very detail-oriented. Um, some neurodivergent individuals are incredibly talented in math, art, music, and honest and straightforward, which can be a plus, but then also maybe can be interpreted a little bit differently, but, but we're gonna talk about that. Okay, so neurotypical, right? So there's the neurodivergent and the neurotypical. This is an individual 
um, who thinks, whose thinking and behaviors tends to be similar to the majority of their peers, the, the, culture, the culture or the society. Um, and the terms neurodivergent and neurotypical were coined by Judy Singer in the late 1970s to really normalize the idea that everybody's brain works differently, right? But again, no wrong, um, not bad, just differently. And to, to really pull us away from the language that we used to use when referring to neurodivergent individuals as abnormal or atypical or wrong. Um, and this and these terms also promote right acceptance and appreciation of the neurodivergent community and talk about their strengths. Okay, so what does this all mean? What does this all mean? So for coaching or counseling, right, the goal is to really support couples where one or both partners are diagnosed or undiagnosed present with social, emotional, or communication differences. So it's really important to understand that many adults late in life get diagnosed maybe with an autism diagnosis or ADHD or um, some other type of developmental difference. And it may not be something that they recognize. It could be something that their partner's been considering, or sometimes it is self-diagnosed. Um, so I think, again, it's important for a clinician to understand that there may be individuals who are seeking support and wanting help to identify what the differences are and how to meet common ground with their partner, but not really know why or, or the how of where it's coming from. So some misconceptions, <laughs> missteps, and misdiagnoses um, that I've experienced, unfortunately, from some of my colleagues who maybe just don't have, again, the information or knowledge of what it means to be neurodivergent. So let's just take typical marriage counseling, right? So what, what does that assume when, when we have people come to our office and we're not thinking through the neurodivergent lens, right? We are maybe assuming that the partners can read social cues and body language, that they understand each other, that they can walk in a room and look at their partner and see that they're in a bad mood or they're looking sad or upset or disengaged. Um, that a partner is ready to just jump on in and help out or with the kids or with a task, with the household chore after being at work all day, like they're, they're just ready to go all the time. Um, that partners can understand and demonstrate perspective taking, which we're gonna spend some time talking about or, or referred to as theory of mind. Um, and that partners understand each other's communication styles well, right? So they really know when I'm talking in this tone, I'm in this kind of mood, if my voice is raised, something else could be going on with my mood. Um, and that their emotional processing is similar to each other, that they feel the same way when something happens, when somebody gets sick or a relative passes away, or there's a wedding to celebrate, um, that they're on, on the same playing field there. Um, and that partners can adapt and follow through with strategies in between counseling sessions, which I think is also something important to just think about as I continue to um, share this information. So what are some of the unfortunate takeaways that I hear about or experience when I have couples come to me? So the neurodivergent experience is often they feel blamed for most of the issues, that everything's their fault. The finger is always pointed at them. Um, this is just one more failure for them, something they can't get right, something they can't do well. If they've experienced other things in their life, developmentally, in high school, college, maybe work has been difficult for them on a certain level. Here's one more thing that they just can't be successful at. They feel demonized. Um, they'll report that they feel like they have more work to do than their partner does, since maybe they're struggling with more issues or different issues, um, and that they're also responsible for making more, more changes. And then obviously that could lead to shutdown in therapy, just not feeling positive or open or heard and listened to and understood. So then therapy really, really for them at least does not benefit 
And then for the neurotypical partner, they could just feel like, oh, frustrated. The tension is worse. We we're in a therapy session and maybe that goes okay, but then we get home and we're supposed to do some things or follow through and nothing happens. Um, feeling hopeless about their relationship, really disappointed in their partner um, and just exhausted. I, I've, when I see couples, it's not uncommon that they have been through two to four different therapists um, and they're just becoming really distrustful and not open to, to the whole process, right? So that's where it's really important to look through the neurodiverse lens, right? Really kind of always thinking about the different ways that people with neurodivergence, again, are perceiving the world, interacting, processing information. So some of the areas that we tend to focus on are communication, um, perspective taking, again, understanding what the other person's view is, emotional regulation, um, being able to, to kind of manage the range of feelings that, that hit us, that we may not even be aware of or happening in the moment. Um, sensory issues are a big one that I'm going to talk with and how that may not only affect day-to-day -day activities, but then also intimacy with, with the partner and executive function. All right, so let's spend a little time on communication. So I love this little cartoon because I think I, I feel this way too, right? My words came out fine. They were just processed incorrectly by your brain, right? So I think something common that we all can, can relate to. So, you know, in coaching or counseling, we really do talk about the nuances of communication, which are so challenging to dissect and always be able to read between the lines. But some of the things I think that are important to focus on <clears throat> is discussing how and why communication styles are different. Again, not bad, not wrong, just different and doing some psychoeducation about neurodivergence and different hardwiring that our brains all have. Um, <clears throat> that communication should really be intentional and focused, right? No, not on your phones. Um, maybe the space needs to be quiet. Maybe you're letting your partner know that I really want to talk to you today after work, or can we, you know, check in this afternoon? Can you give me a call? So um, really kind of letting your partner know, not catching them off guard, that there's something that you want to talk about with them. Being able to gain a greater awareness of your communication, your partner's communication needs. So you know, maybe my needs are just to be heard and listened to, and maybe my partner really needs help problem solving or um, just venting and validation. So there's there's different ways that we all require um, communication being given to us. You know, asking partners to trust that conversations are well-meaning so that to really try and get them to maybe shift all the negativity that they've been experiencing in the past and to think like, okay, my partner is not purposely being sarcastic or obnoxious or making a snarky comment. They just are telling me how they feel, right? And it's not meant in a bad way. They're doing the best that they can. So again, that's that's a big part of, I think, some of the work that we do. And then alternative ways to check in or communicate. So it could be a text during the day, like thinking of you, hope things are going well. Could be a handwritten note, an email, so forth and so on. Um, so again, really kind of thinking outside of the box and being creative with, with how to explain and work with clients within communication. Um, and, in, and I'm making generalities here. This isn't every neurodivergent person, but in general, you know, I've read and, and I hear that neurodivergent individuals can really see a clear path. They're, they're focused on the specifics and the details of things. So they could hear something and be like, well, I know how to solve that problem, right? Where the neurotypical partner may be, may look, be looking at things in a, in a more broadly um, bigger perspective so that they just may be one event. Um, and I'll give you a quick example of a couple that I worked with. So the neurotypical partner um, had an awful day, flat tire, it was raining, she was late for a meeting, she misplaced an umbrella that somebody gave her as a present, like a really good friend. So just having a miserable day um, and really upset and just in general, 
not in a good mood, right? So she talks to her neurodivergent partner about that. And they tend to focus on, well, where do you think the umbrella could be, right? And then she immediately gets upset. Like, why do you care about the umbrella? I've told you that my tire was flat. I was late for a meeting. I lost something that one of my best friends gave me. So, right, so that's just an example, again, of how people are just seeing and interpreting situations differently. He was well-meaning. He wanted to help her find it, find the umbrella. And at that point, she just needed to be acknowledged that she was just having an awful day. So sensory sensitivity. Um, this is a big one that I think is missed a lot. And it isn't something that's often talked about or taught about, I think, in grad school or um, in any psychology courses, right? So we have our five senses. Um, there's been three more that have been added, right? The interception, movement, and balance, meaning like how does like interception is how does my body feel inside? Am I hungry? Am I have a stomach ache? And is that affecting my ability to focus and my mood? Um, my movements and balance. So all of these things can play a role in everybody's day-to-day -day activity. So what happens when we get overloaded by um, our senses, right? So being stressed and burnt out, um, we can be at work all day and we're masking because it's noisy or we have to focus or there's a lot of people wanting our attention and we're really just wanting quiet. And then we come home and our partner is asking us to do three things, help with the kids, get dinner ready, so forth and so on, right? So that can cause a lot of stress sometimes for the neurodivergent individual. Um, anxiety can come from that. If you know our bodies aren't feeling comfortable or calm, our central nervous system is on overload because coming home on the train, there are a lot of people or noises, right? Agitation can be another reaction. Um, to just feeling overwhelmed. Social isolation can be that somebody really can't handle large family gatherings or community parades or going to church or synagogue so that they tend to isolate, right? Which if the neurotypical partner isn't thinking about all of this, it can just seem like they don't care. They're disinterested. They don't wanna do what I wanna do. They don't wanna be a part of our family. So that obviously can cause stress. Um, it affects inability to engage in conversations, focus and concentrate, right? Because if you're, if like, I feel like if somebody is crumpling a piece of paper, that may sound like that to me, but then to somebody else, it could be nails on a chalkboard, right? So really, really thinking about um, how these impact us. And then intimacy is a big one. So Couples could come in and say, we haven't been intimate in a while, and they're just disinterested. They don't find me attractive anymore. It's not important to them, which may not be the case at all, right? So I think it's considering um, the textures and the noise and the sensations that happen with sexual intimacy may be difficult for that person's body and brain to process. And it may be uncomfortable, and it may be a difficult topic to talk about. So again, it's not that, that your partner isn't interested in you and wants to be physically intimate, it's that these other sensory issues are, are causing interference and again, may not be a comfortable topic to, to share or the partner, the ND partner may think they're not gonna get it, they're not gonna understand. So moving on to perspective taking and theory of mind. So this is also a big one. So theory of mind goes to, um, always being able to understand what somebody across the table is thinking about, their feelings, their opinions, what their that their interests may be different than mine, all within the context of what that situation is. If they're at a lecture or a movie or a dinner, while being expected to also monitor your own thinking and your own responding and making sure that you're meeting that person's needs and appropriately communicating with them, being supportive or listening, whatever that may be, which is a huge, huge task. Um, when I was working on this presentation, I was looking at all these different definitions of this and I'm like, oh, it's, it's, it's a lot for anybody. Um, so how do we kind of help people with theory of mind, with learning perspective taking? Sometimes it could be 
saying very concretely, like you need to put your own thoughts on pause, put them over there and just focus on what the person is interested in, what they're sharing, completely focus on what they're communicating with you. Um, it could be that you really need to do intentional listening. So if you're feeling distracted somehow, like if you're home and you can move to another room, ask your partner to say, let's go over here. It's quieter. I, I can hear you better. I can really concentrate more. The other part of it is, again, to really maybe put the ego aside and what you know and be open to this other person's opinions and feelings and thoughts about things and that you may not be right. And it may not even be a right or wrong situation. It just may be that this person thinks differently. Um, and then practicing role playing sometimes is really important to actually use language and help individuals again, kind of rewire some of their patterns or shift how they interact with each other. And this last one, empathy, um, which I think is important to bring up. So for many years, and I think this really um, connects to the autism spectrum individuals is that they weren't empathetic, em empathetic. They couldn't understand, they didn't care about people's feelings, which is so not the truth. It's just that their lived experience and how they experience emotions and feelings are quite different from maybe somebody else. So think about it. If you don't have a certain experience, you may not be able to really understand what that other person is going through in addition to your brain just processing information differently. So again, it's kind of peeling back the layers to show both partners that there is empathy here it's just kind of processed and being displayed in, in different ways. And this is something that I've been seeing in the literature that I just wanted to throw in real quick is the idea of perspective taking versus perspective seeking, um, right? So the thought is that perspective seeking is a better way to approach understanding somebody's point of view. And it really fits in nicely with, again, how we are helping people gain better communication skills or really understand more what their partner is thinking is to ask questions, to ask clarifying questions, to make sure that you understand as opposed to making assumptions. So I just thought that was something interesting um, to throw in here. Um, emotional dysregulation is another area that's often focused on, right? Which um, can be somebody experiencing extreme reaction to something, an overreaction, or it could be an underreaction, right? Some, some, your partner comes home and says somebody at work died or someone has cancer and the partner could, you know, be like, okay, sorry to hear that. And then keep doing what they're doing, right? It doesn't mean they don't care. It just means again, that that's how kind of they're thinking and feeling and able to emote what's going on. Um, or it could be a complete blow up or a meltdown. And you can see that having some emotional dysregulation could impact all aspects of everybody's life, you know, from work to home to friendships. And it's really, really important to identify what this is and name it, not let people continue to think that there's something wrong with them or they're not sensitive enough or they overreact or they have anger management issues, which is what I hear a lot um, from couples when they're working with therapists. So real quick, um, what can trigger dysregulation, right? An immediate change in plans, um, unexpected circumstance at work. Like I was, this presentation is tonight. I've been working on it all week. I've been collaborating. And then somebody calls and says, sorry, stuff, it's canceled. Right. So that could really throw me or I could be like, OK, I want to just go with the flow. It's here. I'll be ready to present whenever the program is rescheduled. Um, perceived or actual negative feedback, sarcastic comments, again, may be um, interpreted in different ways by somebody who is neurodivergent and may have difficulty regulating their emotions sensory overload again, anxiety. So quick, some few strategies that may be helpful to couples that um, you know we sometimes use is it's literally like taking breaks. Give yourself five or 10 minutes. If you're upset and you're in the middle of a conversation, go give yourself you know 10 minutes or say, you know what, now's really not the time that I can talk about this. Um, make sure sleep is so important to make sure that you're you're kind of really rejuvenated after your day, 
Um, sensory seeking. So I talked about sensory sensitivity, but sensory seeking could be ways that people calm themselves, calm their central nervous system. So that could be a weighted blanket, that could be rubbing, that could be swimming and exercise or, you know, being hugged could be something that just helps calm them down. Anything from adjusting your routines or schedules, changing your strategies and how you communicate. Um, and I've mentioned those. The last thing I'll mention is, which I think has often been successful, is a rating scale. So again, if I use the example of this presentation was canceled, I could be really angry, upset, and disappointed, and oh, I wasted all this time, right? So I could maybe feel like an eight or a nine on a scale out of 10, but when I pull back, I could say, you know what, it was just an inconvenience or it's just, I have to go with the flow. And that was maybe a two or a three in reality. So kind of helping individuals name where this is on the scale. Um, and that may help them again, regulate the appropriate reaction to really the, the situation. Executive function. Um, this is a big one. I could spend hours on executive function and how it intersects with neurodiversity. So quickly, um, you know, all of the, the bold words here are things that executive function entails or requires. Um, so planning and organization, working memory, um, being able to attend, both listen and then also ignore stimulus or distractions, which may be hard for someone with neurodivergence, starting a task, impulse control, right? Sometimes um, it's hard. You're thinking something and you're upset and you just spit it out. So being able to know this isn't the time or place, I have to just keep that to myself, right? Problem solving, being flexible cognitively, rolling with the punches, being able to change plans on the spot. And then the last one also is monitoring yourself, right? So tracking your own behavior and how it's impacting whatever setting you're in. Again, work, family with children. And then at the bottom here, I just reminded us of the main areas that we focus on um, when working with couples is communication and perspective taking and emotional regulation and sensory. So you can see how executive function is so important to talk about and think about when we're trying to problem solve and develop new skills and strategies to enable um, couples to just come to a common ground. This really breeds so much misunderstanding and miscommunication. So this executive function is really something that's so important. And lastly, again, just to ask the clinicians in the group, right, to really think about what may be happening for our neurodivergent couples, right? So what may present as somebody being unsympathetic it's just they're thinking differently about things. They're experiencing things about different differently. They're not, they love their partner. They really do care. It's just the way their brain is processing, right? Intimacy issues, again, could be misconstrued when it's really, again, sensory sensitivity. Um, avoidance of behaviors or interactions could be that someone with neurodivergence just gets really hyper-focused on their preferred interests and they don't realize that maybe they're not attending to their partner um, or wanting to go out with you know, other couples, that they're just kind of having fun and enjoying what they're focusing on. Um, and then I hear this one a lot, like social anxiety versus narcissism. Maybe they just like to kind of keep to themselves and focus on them because they can't handle being in um, you know, environments or situations. And sometimes that can be labeled as you're just a narcissist. You just care about yourself. You only want to do what you do. Um, so again, just to end, um, you know, working with neurodivergent couples is pretty different than your typical clinical um, marriage counseling. And it really does require partnership and trust and working towards building, again, better communication on this journey. So thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, and you got some really great comments and questions. Um, and so I'm going to ask you a couple of them, and I'm going to hold a couple of them for after um, Cheryl's presented as well, because um, I think many of us might be able to give some answers. But there's a couple um, that I'm just going to pull out. So um, one of them was, um, will you be commenting on the difficulties we follow through? 
Even outside of the therapeutic environment, many NT partners I've talked with have struggled with diminished follow through in their ND partners. And some of us NTs are not clear on what we can reasonably expect. Um, Cheryl, feel free to jump in if either of you guys have a, have a thought about that. Yeah, I'll just start off, Cheryl, and then I'll pass it on to you. Um, you know, one of the things I think at least that I do is I model this while we're in therapy, right? So we actually practice what it looks like, what it sounds like. I keep expectations very realistic. I mean, one of the things that I always tell my clients is if I'm suggesting something and it doesn't feel right or it doesn't work, you need you need to let me know what, what's happening here, right? So really kind of prioritizing what is one main issue or concern that we really need to work on and small steps, just really not too much all at once. I don't know, Cheryl, if you have other thoughts. I would just underscore what you were saying about, well, pretty much everything, but mostly that um, follow through is really um, something that is an acquired skill. And if you're not used to doing it and it doesn't come naturally to you, then it's going to take a lot of practice. And so therefore each partner in the couple has to be patient with each other, both um, with the person who's being expected to follow through um, and the person who has expectations. So keep your expectations simple and clear. Um, usually put it in writing. Um, I'll talk about this later, but check-ins are very, very important. And recognizing also again um, that, that you reach your goal in very small steps and with successive approximations. So celebrate the wins and let go of some of the disappointments along the way, as long as you're continuing to stay engaged. That's perfect. Thank you both. And I think, you know, as a, as a follow up to that, you know, um, just kind of clarifying. So your expectations can change over time, right? So we start with small, maybe simple expectations, but as each partner grows and as you guys grow as a couple in terms of your communication and, and all of those pieces that we think about in the couple's work that we do, then the expectations change. And, and the, those expectations, those change in expectations can be communicated and should be communicated to each other. Um, so, so I really liked what you said about starting small, but a reminder, um, let's say if the neurotypical partner is like, but, but I have, but but I have all these other needs. Your needs don't need to go unmet, but let's start small. Let's build up to how we can make that work for both partners. Um, there's one other question and then I'll let Cheryl talk and then we'll come back to the other questions. Um, I saw one. Oh, there's so many great questions. Okay. Um, I saw one about um, how do you recommend working with intense self-hatred, sometimes present in ND partners? When they go into self-hatred mode, it makes it hard for them to be present for anything else. That's a great, great question. And I was actually going to add to the last question, but I think it it's a good transition here is sometimes I think our work is spent in the beginning is a lot of healing, right? There's just, because there could there be so much hurt and harmful damage, unfortunately, that's been experienced by the partners in other types of therapies and failures. So the beginning process could be really identifying what those are and how to help heal. And in those, you know, certain situations, I may recommend somebody get individual counseling, right? Sometimes we, we need to do some work on ourselves before we can come together as a couple and, and work on collaborative issues that are bothering us. But that, that comes up a lot. That's a great question. Um, all right, we have lots more st stuff happening in the chat, which is really fabulous. Let's go to Cheryl and then we'll come back to some more of these questions. Um, and I'll start to answer a couple of them in the chat. Stephanie, you're welcome to jump in the chat too. I want to get to Cheryl because then we also have two fabulous couples who are going to share their own lived experience and I don't want people to get tired or hungry and log off. So we'll keep it moving for, for now. Okay, let me just, okay. And I'm going to go through these slides pretty quickly. You can put comments in the chat, but um, as Amanda said, we have two fabulous couples here today and I think that their lived experience will really um, give life to uh, what Stephanie and I are sharing. I also wanna thank Stephanie for the great way that she framed this. And what I'm gonna do is kind of pick up where she left off and um, 
talk a little bit more about what that looks like operationally. Uh, if there were a couple of questions already, how do you and what do you do if? So I'm gonna try to take some of her um, high level and broad perspectives and put it into some practical um, language. But again, neurodiversity describes natural learning and behavioral differences associated with neurodevelopmental conditions in a non-prejudiced way. And that's what's really important when we talk about neurodiversity. Between 30 and 40 percent, it's probably higher, I pulled this last year, of the population may be neurodiverse. If you include that whole umbrella of um, descriptors that were used in Stephanie's first slide, it's probably higher. Um, I always say that we're all neurodivergent to some extent or another, or in one skill or one ability. Um, and so this is really touching on um, a lot of folks. Also, again, uh, Stephanie referenced Judy Singer, but she was very, very clear in using neurodiversity as this descriptor of large populations of people and not using neurodiversity as a synonym for a neurological disorder. And the emphasis there is on learning about neurodiversity to shift the focus from impairments towards different abilities. And this really plays into neurodiverse couples. You, as, as couples start to recognize and understand their challenges and differences through a neurological lens, this really helps couples reframe and look at things in terms of differences, differences rather than deficits, and start to actually recognize and appreciate naming probably first and appreciate the strengths and talents of their partners. We tend to focus on the challenges, but um, there's lots of good stuff there, as Stephanie had pointed out also in many, many areas of um, life. Differences are associated with neurologically based characteristics that impact behavior, communication, and perspective. So that means that some of those things that are neurologically based may appear to one partner as someone's lack of attention or interest um, or rigidity that's just because you're trying to make me angry, but to recognize that um, that's not the case, that these characteristics or traits that are neurologically driven or neurologically based can impact behavior and communication and perspective in ways that um, are not often understood. Once couples are more comfortable accepting their partner, then they can also be more receptive to learning helpful strategies to improve their relationship. So what are some of the tasks for couples in couples counseling? And I thought this was important to consider because sometimes I get asked, um, why should I go to counseling? Now, Stephanie did talk about some of the reasons that people have felt in the past that their attempts at repairing or improving their relationships were thwarted in counseling. In neurodiverse couples counseling, the major tasks are really to recognize these behaviors and traits that are based in neurology. Understanding that neurological differences have both a positive and a challenging aspect to start to then accept different languages. It's really, uh, sometimes people will say, oh, so it really is like learning a new language. It's like, yes, you're learning to communicate in a way that your partner will understand what you're trying to say. Um, and that takes a skill and a finesse, but also it really takes a willingness. And it also means um, having a respect that each partner must demonstrate and really have, um, respect for that other perspective. So when we talk about perspective taking, it really might mean changing our approach, adjusting expectations um, and reactions. And what is the role of the therapist in all of this? Well, really the therapist has some really specific goals here. And one is to support the couple's understanding of the impact of neurodiversity and help them develop those skills for the therapists themselves to apply that neurological lens to understanding the couple's issues. In neurodiverse couples counseling and coaching, the emphasis is on um, goal setting, respecting couples' priorities. That means that I don't come in with my own agenda, although maybe I have some ideas and thoughts about what would improve your relationship, but we start with the couple's priority, the issues that they wanna deal with, 
um, and also accept and allow couples to say, I'm not ready for this now, or I'm not comfortable with what you're asking me to do. And so it's priorities and preferences, really, I should say. We also want to stay solution focused and strength based, recognizing each partner's strengths. Um, can really, really be helpful in helping them figure out how to apply those strengths to specific challenges that they're experiencing. We're trying to build understanding and connection between the couple, but also between the couple and the therapist together. So the more I get to understand that couple and what makes them tick and what's important to them, the more I can come up with um, a tool or a strategy that they can use and help them tweak and refine that, as was explained before, if things don't go exactly the way one expects. We also try to stay present and future focused as opposed to dwelling on the past. Sometimes you do have to go back and repair and help someone understand how past experiences and triggers and traumas uh, quite often can impact the present and also determine our responses and reactions. Um, I tend to be um, very um, uh, flexible. Maybe it's a way of modeling, but um, sometimes I work with folks on Zoom, uh, sometimes in person, but where someone wants to sit, if couples want to sit next to each other or on Zoom, sometimes couples will be in different rooms. Sometimes they'll be next to each other on the couch, but using two different laptops. Um, sometimes folks need to um, do things for um, sensory regulation that may seem counterintuitive, like um, tapping or wearing noise canceling headphones um, or um, using the chat, even if we're meeting so that they can stay focused. I'm, I'm really flexible with all of that. I just want people to be able to say, this is what I need to stay focused. This is what I need to stay present with you. And also for the, the couple, each partner to be able to say about the pace that we're moving at, if we're going too fast, if we're going too slow, if they're starting to feel triggered. Um, and it's really, um, really interesting to see how that happens as people start to become more comfortable with both the language and understanding their own needs and starting to be better um, advocates for themselves, both parts of the couple, it really does open up communication a lot. So again, as Stephanie mentioned, looking through a neurodiverse lens, these are the lots of other issues, lots of other problems, but these are the key ones that really tend to impact a relationship. Communication is probably by and large the biggest one. It's also the one that's maybe the closest related to the, you know, some of the core features of um, autism. But perspective taking, emotional regulation, executive functioning, and sexuality and intimacy are right up there. So, so what we're, I'm going to spend the most time here on communication, but I'm still going to go through it pretty quickly. So how do we get there? So what are some skills that are important to, to learn how to do? It's very important to learn some new skills regarding listening and speaking. And there are tools that can be taught about how to have a dialogue, how to emotionally connect through words, through tone, through um, not speaking. Um, some of the techniques can include everything from using scales to help to identify or describe feelings, emotional states, dysregulation, to be able to know when someone needs to ask for a timeout, to be able to ask clarifying questions, and to stay open and interested. The goal of listening and speaking is really for one to find out about the other, not to be able to say what it is that we've already been planning in our mind. So if you look at these two little per people, this person's speaking and this person's really already thinking about how they're gonna respond, what they're gonna say, or maybe trying to just negate what that, that person's saying. Um, some things that I'll actually do is talk to people about 
using a timeout. There are some tips here at the end that I'll go through, or um, if they're really having a really hard time and it's something folks can do at home is I'll give them an object, a ball, whatever, and the person who's holding the ball is the one that talks. And so the other one just cannot speak as long as they follow those ground rules while that person's holding the ball. And then there's a structure and then they pass that back. Um, Self-awareness and self-advocacy is really important. So what this is meant to communicate is that one person may have a much greater ability to express emotions. Their, their, their um, language, their fluency with words may be very different. Another person may have just a few emotions that they can clearly identify. They may not be able to really understand how they're feeling in the moment, which, so if I say to you, how are you feeling? And you say, I don't know, or okay, it doesn't share much information, but it could be um, true. The other side of it is, is that what I said before about self-advocacy, it may take a while for one person or another to be able to say, I need this, I need a timeout, I need a break. One of the things that we use there um, that's really helpful is a code word where somebody knows that if, if it's too triggering or too difficult, that they have a code word for when they need to stop that conversation or when they are starting to feel um, upset or dysregulated. And that is a way to communicate to the other person. And then there's an agreement that's set that if one person says pineapple or Florida, that that means that it's just time to stop right now. Um, initiating and maintaining conversation is often very difficult. Sometimes one person really likes to talk and the other person has, has this responds with one or two words. So there are some strategies that you can use. Um, literally one is a lot involves practice, 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 practice. Um, and one is doing things where someone may have something in mind, they give a message, and then you actually have that person who's receiving the message, give that person feedback on what they heard them say. That person validates or affirms that, and then may ask another question or may share more information about what they're wanting to share. Um, what sometimes has to happen is that the sender, um, usually that's the NT partner, has to slow down their communication and or limit their communication and, and stick with just the most salient features. Um, and this person has to make sure that they've really understood and gives that person feedback before asking another question. And it can be very effective. So in terms of perspective taking, one is just recognizing that there are different perspectives. Believe it or not, before you can even get to flexibility of thinking, you have to understand and accept that somebody has a different perspective that's valid and right, as right as yours is. Um, so if you're looking at this, I don't know if people want to put in the chat, but there's actually two different things that you could see here. Um, and I'm just going to tell you one's a duck and one's a bunny, and we can come back to it later, but we'll use this a lot if people are saying, well, she's wrong, or we never do that, or that doesn't make any sense. I'll say, well, remember about duck bunny that there's two perspectives. The other is to have not just recognizing that there are two perspectives, but one is having flexibility with our own thinking. So if you look at this one, this is that one person sees a six and one sees a nine. And why is that? It's because of the way they're looking at the object. So not only is it valid to have a different perspective, but that your perspective is gonna be informed by both how you take in information and how you um, perceive, interpret, summarize, um, a whole lot of things, the information that you're looking at. So that flexibility, and somebody can say, yeah, there's two different perspectives, but mine is still right. Um, getting to see that there, that you can be flexible can be um, really important. So these are just from some blogs and websites of what um, partners say that it's important. Um, all are saying really, talk to your partner. 
um, a lot of times that's the biggest problem is that, that we're not making good connections. We're spending too much time not communicating. It's really important to avoid teasing, sarcasm, or dark humor. It's, it's Don't always assume that your partner's going to know what you mean, and that can always can go bad. At least that's what it says here. Um, and and it's a it's a more nuanced type of communication. Talk to your partner. Put what you want, how you feel, what you want to say to them. Say it clearly. Keep a sense of humor. Keep your communication clear, calm, and predictable. Um, Clarity is important. Calmness, tone. I hear this a lot. Um, and um, keep your communication very um, concrete, specific, and um, let someone know in advance if you're telling them something that's time sensitive. Um, consider visual supports. I cover this a little bit later, but I'll just go through it now. Visual supports can be really, really helpful. Somebody in the chat had said, does that literally mean? Yes, it does. Notes, emails, whiteboard, calendars. A lot of people now are using Google Docs and shared calendars and um, like keeping up a running list. And as you get through that, you cross it off and then you add some new issue or something that you wanna discuss with your partner. Emotional regulation is another one that's really important. And that can lead a lot to um, meltdowns and shutdowns. The best way to manage meltdowns and shutdowns is to avoid them. The best way to do that is to manage stress. You want to become aware of early warning signs. And sometimes the first person to recognize those warning signs is the partner. If you can use those code words to be able to help your partner realize that things are starting to get a little bit out of control, then that can be very, very helpful. Um, understanding triggers. We spend a lot of time, especially like in uh, more educational ways of helping people identify their own triggers and letting them know that the same thing might be triggering at one time of day or in one specific situation and not in another. Um, some of the things that exacerbate um, tiredness, hunger, and then also allowing a lot of uh, calming and recovery time. And again, that can vary from person to person. Executive functioning, I think most of this has been covered, but what I want to just again uh, clarify again is that having um, planning is really important, follow through, knowledge, like do you know what to do and do you know the right questions to ask so that you can be successful? Some people just don't know the right questions to ask. Um, it's that adult learning topic of I don't know what I don't know. Those are the blind spots. And then understanding the expectations. You might both say, um, we want to um, uh, we want to paint the kitchen, um, but maybe the expectations are different. One partner doesn't understand that that might mean taking everything out of the kitchen, or it might mean that there's a certain financial cost because you're going to have to bring in a professional painter or how long it's going to take or even um, uh, putting away your clothes, the more clear you can be about it, the less confusion there is. If two people have different expectations, it also makes it more difficult. Some of the roadblocks or stumbling blocks can be um, these differences that can be attributed to processing skills, auditory and visual, um, anxiety, previous experiences, some people can become very fearful of trying something new. Another one would be just, again, this idea of working cooperatively. Some people can take a task and do it themselves, but the first time you say, no, no, you both have to agree, this has to be shared, um, it's difficult to know how to do that. Um, intimacy is another one. So intimacy is different than um, sexuality. It's broader. It includes physical touch. It includes um, sexual intimacy, but it's really about making connections. And I talk a lot with people about making connections. Many, many neurodiverse couples struggle with this idea of emotional connection and intimate communication. Um, and this is where people talk about feeling lonely, not heard, not understood. Little things make a big difference and small connections occurring in throughout the day 
um, are much, much better than a few big gestures. I liken it to drinking water. We need it all the time. Um, making connections is sort of how we're hardwired as people. Um, and so the more that we can do that and experience that with our partner, that can really contribute to making a relationship more satisfying. How do you do that? Giving constructive feedback, acknowledgements, um, notes, words of appreciation can be really, really helpful. Um, you have to learn how to do that. Talk to your partner about finding out what they want. Um, also, um, it's going to take some time. It's just another one of those things before you feel comfortable doing these things. It's going to take some tweaking and some work. Um, there are two nice articles on um, that I like to share with people. One's called Having a Good Morning and the other is Good Afternoon. And there's supposed to be a third article in this series um, written by Grace Myhill of AANE &E, um, about little things that you can do to make connections. Everything from saying good morning, believe it or not, or saying someone's name, you know, good morning, Amanda. Good morning, Stephanie. Have a great day. Oh, is today the day that you're giving that presentation? Do we have time to have a cup of coffee together? I know one couple who started their day and created a routine and a ritual around having tea. And the um, husband really liked making tea. Um, and then he would ask, he would initiate contact by asking his wife if she wanted tea. And if she said yes, that meant she was open and receptive to them spending time together. They would drink tea together and they would spend about 15 minutes um, talking about something that was mutually agreed upon. Intimacy and sensory is a little bit different. This affects all of those areas, communication, uh, describing what one feel, what wants and needs, how that physical touch feels. What are the expectations? Expectations can include everything from frequency to um, initiation to um, uh, trying to think of some of the other words without getting too much into detail, but being clear about what your expectations are in any moment where um, actual physical intimacy is going to occur is very, very important. Um, preference is really important all along the way to share those. Experience can make a big, big difference. And then those sensory issues. Some people really have a hyper and a hypo sensitivity. I'm reminded of one couple where the wife really wanted to be physically close to her husband. And um, uh, uh, sh her interpretation of her partner's pulling away from her when she moved towards them was that he didn't want to be close with her anymore. What turned out to be the case was that he was very uncomfortable with being touched um, in a certain way. And he was very uncomfortable um, giving touch. He was comfortable giving touch, but was uncomfortable receiving touch. And so what they worked out that really worked out and allowed them to move forward was that he was perfectly okay with her putting her head on his shoulder, um, with her putting her arm on his arm, and with her letting then letting him take the initiative. Once they did that, she was able to physically move closer to him, put her head on his shoulder and feel very much closer to her partner. Um, and that made a big difference. So the last thing that I just want to go over really, really quickly, and I think we'll be sharing these presentations. If not, I can share it with you, is that there are a lot of resources out there. Please don't ever feel like you're alone. Um, and those of you who are professionals working with couples, there are resources there for therapists as well. Um, there, uh, I also, um, you know, I'm part of um, peer support groups and consultation groups. Um, there are also um, Facebook groups just for um, neurodiverse couples, coaches, and therapists. So if you're in a professional role, you can seek support. If you're in a professional role working with individuals who are on the spectrum, there are folks out there who are actually working with couples who can help you with some specific skills that you might be able to teach 
and coach your clients on. Um, but so these are some of those um, internet resources. And there are a number of organizations who provide training and support. AANE, the Association for Autism and Neurodiversity is one, um, as well as um, I'll just call out a few other ones, um, the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network, Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. Depending upon where you see yourself, there is some organization or group, some information, some resources there that can help you feel included. There are lots of books. These are a few. I've got a much larger list to share with you. And two I'm just going to call out are lessons learned from neurodiverse couples. So let me just go back. Oh, I'll go down. Um, that there are two books that came out in the last year or two that were actually written by neurodiverse couples. Um, and it's a marvelous uh, new trend because it, it really gets you to see it from the relationship from the inside out, if you will. And so these are just some tips from that couple, Sarah and Larry or another couple. They also have blogs and you can hear them on YouTube and whatnot. And then some of the books, some of the folks who have websites who are, um, uh, experts in the field who've written a lot. I'll just say the names really quickly. Um, Penina Arad, um, Maxine Aston, Tony Atwood, um, David Finch. David Finch's book is by um, a neurodiverse partner. Um, it's often recommended to somebody before they receive a diagnosis um, based on what this partner learned about how to be a better husband. Um, Eva Mendez has a number of books as well. And um, this is the last one is, uh, sorry, that's on the list twice. It shouldn't. Um, <laughs> um, Have They Gone Nuts? The Survival Guide to Social Interaction in Neurodiverse Relationships. So what are some of the takeaways from neurodiverse couples? Don't take things personally. You sort of have to learn how to disengage, not detach, but disengage so that if your partner is really speaking honestly and open that there is a safe space and you can hear what they have to say without necessarily getting defensive or um, feeling like you have to strike back. Understanding each other's social quotas, we haven't talked about that, but you're both going to have needs that have to be met in social situations. And there, it's a great way to use a code word to say, I need some alone time now. I'm halfway on the way to having a meltdown, I'm going to go do that etc. Respect and seek to understand each other's different love languages. Um, not necessarily the book love languages, but in general, the way we give and receive love, the things that validate ourselves are going to be different. So you want to try to understand that. Um, and knowing that there are going to be challenges along the way, make some time for each other, and that each of you can have a different perspective and both be right. I think if that was one takeaway that you take away from this, um, that would be it, because that makes such a difference. So I do want to leave you with a thought. It's something that I've just found really important in my own understanding. This is actually um, a Maori word for autism, and it's um, takiwatanaga. Tanga, Takiwa Tananga. And it was coined by a gentleman who's a Maori for uh, resources called the uh, terms called the language of enrichment. And it's a derivative of his own term for autism. So this one means in his, her own time and space. And his is a slightly different word, and the parens for there is mine, but that my, his, her, their own space. And if we can think of a word, a new definition for ourselves, for to give couples a new language, a language of enrichment for their relationships, then I feel like neurodiverse counseling will be um, the effective tool that I know it is. Thank you so much, Cheryl. That was really wonderful. Um, and we all, like before, we have some amazing, amazing questions in the chat. Um, again, I really want to get to our couples because they are patiently waiting. And I know that you all really just want to hear from them. They have so much great experience. But I do want to bring up one question for Stephanie and Cheryl, um, because this has come up a couple of times in a couple of different questions. Um, can either of you guys speak to strategies to work through demand avoidance in couples work? Oh, 
Um, I, I can jump in, I, I guess, Stephanie. Will... Sorry, I was muted. Go ahead, Cheryl. <laughs> sure. Uh, this is this is difficult. I think that um, sometimes what actually that I find um, can work is two things that I mentioned already. One I mentioned and one that I haven't mentioned. One is the code word. So that if it's getting too difficult, um, um, you know, this PDA refers to pathological demand avoidance, which has to do with somebody refusing to follow a request, whether it's, I want you in the morning to wake up and say my name, <laughs> and their partner just won't do it, to everything from, I want you to take out the garbage or, um, you know, help me, uh, everything like that. And um, one of the things is having a code word and the other is having agreements. So I think that within the context, um, as a diagnosis, this is subsumed under autism. So it could also be that the person who is experiencing PDA or who has been diagnosed with PDA may need to receive some individual coaching and therapy and treat it the way you would any other comorbidity, if you will, if there's depression too or um, processing issues um, and things like that, or anger um, that has to be dealt with, that they do that on their own and then come back into the session. But if it's, if it's a general idea that we don't have a diagnosis, we don't know if that's exactly what we're dealing with, but we're dealing with a situation where a partner just is not cooperative and not willing to work together, then I like to try to see if they can both agree that if they're committed to the relationship, that means that they will stop doing certain things, like maybe being very negative, or, and that they stay open and receptive to maybe trying something new and giving them a framework. So it could be, it could be a better diagnosis, better understanding of the meaning for that individual, that behavior, maybe individual therapy and tools that you can give the couples themselves to work on together. And Cheryl, I think, thank you. Your response actually brought up a couple other topics that came up in the chat. Um, one around kind of the way that couples counseling or couples therapy may differ from, uh, for neurodiverse couples may differ from uh, neurotypical couples is that, yes, I, I do think, and I, I think there was a little bit of discussion about this in the chat, that we are often more directive than maybe another therapist might be. We are, we're providing psychoeducation, but we're also kind of directly sharing skills and then practicing them together. Um, so a therapist who, who, or a counselor or, or a coach who's trained in working with neurodiverse couples should really be able to, to provide that type of support as opposed to just a listening ear that you might get from a different type of therapist. Um, Stephanie, did you wanna answer the question about uh, demand avoidance before we move on? I think Cheryl covered it really well, and I don't want to, I know we have our couples here, so I'm anxious to hear from them. Okay. I know there's plenty of other amazing questions in the chat. I think we're all able to stay, um, you know, for a little while after our couples, so we can, we'll, we'll have a panel and we can answer a couple more questions. So um, we will do our best to get to all of the questions or at least pieces of all of the questions. Um, but we do have two fabulous couples here. Um, they're going to share about their lived experience, and then you'll have an opportunity to ask them questions as well. Um, so we will start with the Bostons. If you want to um, turn your camera on and I'm going to give you all the floor to share a little bit about your um, relationship, your lived experience in couples counseling and anything that you um, want to share with us. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's really cool being here and learning all this great information from uh, our presenters. Um, so let's see. How can I start this? So I'll just start a kind of brief introduction about myself. So I am uh, the more neurodivergent person in the relationship. I would probably describe, I would describe my wife as more neurotypical. And um, so let's see, how do we, so, so just a brief background, like how we met. So we've been married six years. Uh, we started off, we met each other on an internet dating app. Uh, Tinder is a we're a Tinder success story. So um, you know, old Tinder, old Tinder. Good point. Good point. Yes, old Tinder. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so um, so it's been interesting for me this whole journey because you know I was diagnosed with ADHD at a young age, but some of the more stuff that that we've been working on and kind of discovering has kind of been a more of a a later. Uh, 
awakening, you know, so I kind of, I guess what I'm trying to say is I am still on the journey of discovering like what neurodiversity means and how my brain works and all that stuff. And I'm really, really interested. And I found a lot of, uh, a lot of help from some of the like tools and strategies that I've employed that Cheryl and Stephanie have talked about. It's, I found those to be very helpful in my relationship. And um, and I noticed that, I mean, kind of to Stephanie's point, something that popped in my mind was like some of the other counseling that I saw, it, like just didn't work. It, it you know, wasn't uh, like for, for a number of reasons, like I didn't, it didn't really resonate with me as much. So, um, so you know, some of the uh, strategies like, like Cheryl talked about, like agreements and things like that, that was, that's been very, very helpful for me uh, in terms of trying to, uh, trying to become a better husband, really. So, but what, what would you like to say, darling? Ditto. <laughs> Ditto all of that. And some of the things I think about are, I saw a number of questions come up in the chat as both Stephanie and Cheryl, you were presenting. And in terms of navigating the couplehood and what that means and some of the challenges that one might experience as they are on the journey together, I think for us, one of the things a number of things that we focus on. I know for me, sometimes I think I saw someone talk about burnout. And I remember when I first, it was early in our marriage, actually, when I felt I was just being feeling exhausted and I, I didn't really connect the dots. And I was just thinking, I feel exhausted and I'm not sure why. And what I have learned is I was over-functioning. I was over-functioning because I needed to over-function and I didn't realize it at the time. Um, and so we talked about it. We started talking about what does it mean and what's happening here and why are these things occurring? And as a result of having these conversations and really me doing introspection and taking personal responsibility, some of the things that I have come to incorporate more it, are self-care, like really being intentional about taking care of me. We were talking with some uh, couples recently and uh, a word picture that I used was because it's very easy for me to, if we're looking at a, a gear shift in a, an automatic vehicle, it's easy for me to be on in sixth gear constantly because I just function like that just on a regular basis. And but what I realize is when I do that in our marriage, it, it exhausts me. And so to help myself to be more balanced, I downshift. So I'll coast in third gear. And whatever happens as a part of our dynamic, as a part of our household, because I am in third versus continuing to uh, roll in sixth gear, we navigate that together. So if some things aren't attended to in the expeditious manner that I would prefer, oh, well, it's okay. It will get attended to. That's a part of the way that I, I learned to take care of myself. Another piece that I have embraced, and we joke about this, is you know just gratitude. I think things increase the more we focus on them. And so I focus on all the wonderful things that we have as a couple. I focus on the blessing that uh, he is, to me, because there's so much good. There's so much good. And really focusing on those things, especially when I feel frustrated you know, about things that may not be a part of that experience. And that, uh, we talked about perspective taking, that helps me to shift my perspective. And it, it's, a for me, a very healthy way to navigate what sometimes feels nuanced or challenging or frustrating focus on the good. What are the blessings? What are the, the good things? And we talk, uh, we do check-ins mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Those are things that we really practice and it's a part of our culture. <laughs> we actually started doing it when we were dating and because we continue our date night in our, our marriage, we utilize that as an opportunity to check in with each other. And that's been really, really helpful and beneficial to really just ground us and to remind us that although we're apart, we're 
engaged in the hustle and bustle of what, you know, couple life is, we can take a break and breathe and reconnect and yeah. engage in each other outside of the, I got to do this for my job. I got to do this appointment for these things, all the nuanced realities that are part of life in general. Yeah. And I, and I think one of the things that, that really, I think kind of the core things that we both uh, buy into and have an agreement upon is like, we've, we, we approach our relationship from, well, we consider ourselves like a strength-based couple, right? So that means that I do some things better than Nabishi and Nabishi does some things better than me. And we kind of make space for those things. And we kind of understand what those things are and we kind of support each other. Uh, and, and, and even more, and to, and, and to an even more extent, we recognize when some person's working in their strength and the other is not, basically. So that's been an approach that's really, uh, I think, done wonders in our relationship um, because, you know, it's just, um, it's kind of just, it, it allows you to, I mean, it celebrates, you know, what you bring to the relationship and, and it also makes space for, uh, for you to say, okay, well, I'm not as good at this, so let me take a step back, basically. So that's something that, that I found has worked for us. And uh, another thing, uh, so just for me, like, as I think about this, another thing I want to say is like the agreements, like, so that's something that we work on with our therapists, like, so a lot of times we have disagreements over like chores or household duties. And what I found is that making a list, writing it down, these are things you've heard before from the, pres from the presenters, like writing it down, coming to a common agreement is something I can see as tangible. And then, I, I mean, I don't always get it, but at the same, at the same time. I guess what I'm trying to say is like, it's something I can touch, react to, and have a kind of tangible measurement against, you know, when I'm, when I'm falling short, when I'm holding up to the agreement. And it's not that I always get there, but, you know, it's one of those things that kind of helps me process and uh, strive toward what I agree to. So anyway. Some of the practical. Practical. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. That, yeah. So what we use, um, Y'all are iPhone users notes on iPhone where we can share our notes. Yeah. That accountability has been really beneficial for us. And then shared calendar has yeah. also been helpful uh, to keep us on track and um, help for a more fluid way to navigate our needs, either throughout the day or just our lives in general. Yeah. I love the shared calendar and you can even add reminders to your calendar with like alerts. So if you're like, yes, I'm committed to taking out the trash, but I just can't remember it. You have an alert every Sunday night, take the trash out, whatever it is. Um, so that's a great point. Um, did you guys want to share anything else before we move on to our next couple? You, you will still have time to answer questions at the end, but anything We're else? We're happy to move on. Yeah, let's give them the time to talk. All right, um, Mike and Anne-Marie. You're Hello, on. everybody. Hi. I was thinking I've got fireworks going off in my head from what we've covered so far. I'm going to keep those going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so to give you an overview of what we want to touch on, uh, I wanted to first talk about what I experienced. I have a, a visualization we'll bring up in a little bit that I'm going to turn it over to Anne-Marie, who's done some wonderful introspection. <laughs> uh, we were saying that Last week was actually 10 years since our first date. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so do you want to... Oh, yeah. Yeah, you want to start? or 10 years, and then we locked it down for eight. Yeah, that's uh, right. And then we're going to circle back and talk about some tools. So uh, can you bring up the oh, sure. spider chart? Okay, yeah, here we go. So ready? I remember reading this in an article. Okay, let's go big here. It's this right here. Yeah. There we go. I can see right here. So I remember reading something like this in an article before, and I was like, oh, my sweet goodness. Uh, so when I think of like neurodivergence, I think of it in a, in a linear way. And when I saw this, it was like, <clears throat> ah! like things kind of lit up for me. And so just in preparing for our talk, I found a resource online. I don't know if it's like validated, but I was like, let's just do it and see how multidimensional this is here. And just taking a gander, that looks like there's some areas that are more pronounced and some areas that are less pronounced so based on the questions that were yes, asked. Yeah. yeah. So this was your self reflection. My self reflection. The visual of your self reflection. 
Got it. Okay. Yeah. It's not secretly Anne Marie's <laughs> Okay, continue. That'll do later. Okay. But anyways, continue. after party. Uh so the sensory, especially sensory stuff, the noise sensitivity, it makes me appreciate how much I love my young kids. We have a son who's six and a daughter who's four. They are amazing. Uh when it was especially when they were young, it was certainly a challenge for me. Um, and then I have some unusual mannerisms that I think is part of the what makes me unique and enjoyable to interact with. And we each have like our own thing, which is uh, we are like a hoot in that way, uh, especially at the same time if we're all going hog wild. Um, so we had a family member that actually uh, was, was doing her. Uh, no, I'm going to come right oh, back. Okay. Okay. She was doing her a PhD at Duke in childhood psychi psychology, I believe. And she was like, you know what? Have you guys ever looked into this neurodivergent stuff? And it literally had not been on our radar before. So that's how we began our journey here. Um, so there are some areas, uh, for example, anxiety and depression shows up as moderate here. So I found fantastic psychiatrist that's really helped with that. Um, we've been doing couples counseling as well. Uh, so there are a lot of tools, and we're going to kind of circle back to that. So over to you, Okay. MRS. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I just wanted to touch on a little bit um, what Mike was saying. So basically, um, we, yeah, so we're the parents of two young kids. And for us, we, we realized that we really needed support once um, we had kids. At that point, um, the challenges... Um, were so great that we knew it was time to get some extra support. So we didn't feel like we were um, just really struggling. Um, and I just wanted to say a little bit about the difference between um, a regular marriage counselor and then the neurodiverse counseling. For sure. Because we've, um, we've had um, two different counselors. Um, so we started um, in our marriage with just a regular marriage counselor. And I'm just using this as an example to show how much we appreciate now our neurodiverse coaching and how it's way more specific to our situation. Um, and shout out to Cheryl, who has been talking. She's our counselor and she's amazing. Um, but anyway, so in our experience with one regular marriage counselor that we did previously, um, she, uh, the person was very well-intentioned and kind and um, but we found we were not really making progress and we were still having, you know, the daily challenges and daily frustrations and making no progress on that. And we felt that the counselor did not really understand our unique challenges. And the counselor just was often minimizing our struggle and also dismissing our unique challenges. And they would often use blanket statements of, oh, you know, everyone's going through that. Everyone's going through that, you know, it's gonna be fine. But the thing is that looking back on that in our experience, you know, having a, a young child and a newborn, we could see that the experiences that we were going through were not just what everyone else was going through. Um, and I can go into more of that later. But the counselor that we had previously, just uh, as nice as they were, they weren't equipped to help us grow at the rate that we wanted to. We really wanted to make improvement and not just coast. Um, so they might have, that counselor might have been able to help us a little bit, but could only take us so far. And often there was the reassuring of like, oh, that's normal. That was not helpful at all to us. Um, we knew that the things that we were experiencing were not typical. And we are now, you know, not afraid of the fact that we aren't typical. We're not embarrassed or we try not to be of the fact that we are not typical. And instead of being reassured that we're typical, we prefer to dive in and understand ourselves better and work with like experts in the field that have so much more support and understanding and knowledge specific to our situation. So that is um, kind of how we ended up with amazing Cheryl. And it has been um, just so incredible for us. I mean, we are a huge, still a huge work in progress. Cheryl's got her work cut out for her, but, um, we've been going to neurodiverse couples coaching for a year now, 
and we definitely are making progress. And I am just so grateful for that because we came from a place where we were feeling um, just really struggling in many different areas. And, you know, there was like the resentment building and, um, and, you know, life is short. You want to enjoy your time with your spouse and you want to appreciate them. And so that's, that's our goal of where we wanted to get, you know, um, and she's really helping us get there. Um, and then, um, yeah, just to touch on a little bit of some of the challenges that, we saw when we first had kids um, was, um, well, I have anxiety and then Mike's neurodiverse. Um, so when, once we had our baby, uh, my post, I had postpartum anxiety that just skyrocketed. So the combination of my massive anxiety that at the time I wasn't treating um, and the combination of that with what Mike was experiencing, which was um, feeling very much like he was out of his depth. Um, uh, extremely, you know, all these things he had had challenges previously, but it really came to a head with the increase of strain in our marriage with our beautiful children, which we are so grateful for. Um, but yes, extreme sensitivity to noise and then also new challenges that he was experiencing with some of the social interactions with the babies. So, you know, he just um, is not able to soothe a baby. And, you know, I, you know, he thought that would just come naturally to him. And so did I. And we were realizing that that was not happening. And we, at the time, we didn't know why, like, why is this not happening? Like it is for everybody else. Like we're seeing other, other fathers holding their kid and able to do that. And it was extremely um, frustrating for Mike that he wasn't able to. And that you know, sent him into a depression. Um, so anyway, all this to say, we were starting at a point where we were very much struggling and we realized we could no longer just figure it out on our own. And that, why, why do we need to figure it out on our own? There's people that are specialized in this and they're gonna help us navigate this. And the idea of just, oh, I'll just figure it out on my own was not working out for us. And so, I guess I just want to really encourage people that are considering this, um, that if there's a need to just try out neurodiverse couples coaching, um, because I just trying to figure it out on your own, this stuff is way more complex than can just be figured out by reading a few articles. Um, and um, yeah, we've just found so much enrichment from it. Um, and then I don't know if we want to go into some of the tools that were helpful for us. Maybe um, the tools really Okay, quick. just so we okay. maybe just touch on like the top two. Oh so, yeah, I said the top ones here. I would say the equivalent of one neuro neurodiverse aware session is about the equivalent of 10 um, not neurodiverse aware sessions. So the ROI is amazing. The thing that's works best for us is green, yellow, red. So this is for everyone in our family will do. So I'm in the green. Great hug away, like, you know, feel free to give your kids kisses. I'm in the yellow. This is where like, you gotta take it easy, back off. And red is like, okay, time to go in the other room. So the phrase that I recently started that is super helpful, because I was like, okay, I gotta pick something memorable. For a code word of you. Of you uh oh, friends. spaghetti out. It's like, <laughs> okay, just go. And it's like, because it's so funny. Like for me, I just, something that cracks me up in my brain's like, oh, I can never would hear that anywhere else. So that's what's helped us with knowing the zone yeah, of regulation. That was just like one of the many things Cheryl's helped yeah. us with because she realized we needed to have a code word with Mike because I would say things like, honey, you are in the red, like you're really stressed out. I can tell you need a break right now to just calm down. And he would like look back at me with a blank face. And so we were just having some, you know, communication difficulties. So anyway, just a funny code word that he came up with oh, yeah. was, uh-oh, spaghetti. No, your kids and are then in the he red. knows that, okay, it's time for me to just take a relaxing break and just like get myself regulated. Yeah. Um, and then that goes for all of us. All of us do that. The other one, yeah. that's- I mean, not the uh-oh, spaghetti, but yeah. the regulating. The other yeah. one that's yeah. game changer is a mood journal. So it's a daily planner that you chat how you're doing. So I tend to look at it retrospectively, but proactively seeing, okay, I've got appointments four days in a row and this chore and that chore. And it's like, you're just asking for a hot mess at that point. So tracking how you're doing and making sure everyone's getting a good break is 
Oh yeah, because basically you saw you had many appointments and that you were going to need some downtime is what you're saying, right? Yeah, or you yeah. need or, you know, yeah. like that. Yeah, the the red, yeah. And also with understanding neurodiversity, it changed, um, oops, I didn't want to interrupt you. No, you're good. Um, it changed my expectations with things. So um, kind of I grew up with the like, okay, just, you know, suck it up, get through it, grit through it, like, and you sure. could do it. And there's like a ton of good with that, a ton of good, but, and you can accomplish a lot and you're sacrificing for others and it's awesome. But in the case of neurodiversity, I have to be way more in tune to if Mike says he needs a break, he needs a break. It's hard enough for him to say he needs a break. So when he says it, he needs it. And it's not time to grit through it. It's time to pause and, you know, him to get the time he needs to regroup. And so we're just um, more in lockstep with that. And it feels great to be like united on that front, understanding what we need. Yeah. Um, did you want to say anything else or those are the main things? Yeah, those are the main <laughs> things. There's tons more that we could say, but we'll stop it at that. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I think what I was picking up from the last thing you were saying that I really loved was really, you know, Henry, I feel like you were saying like, I, like I honor Mike when he says, Hey, I need a break. I honor that because I get that he means it. And I, and we need to find space to do that. And it sounds like you guys do a really nice job mm -hmm. in your relationship of doing that for each other. Yeah. And mm -hmm. for me, it was really helpful to even, I wasn't even aware when I would need it and to be able to verbalize, I always felt like a burden because I kind of had that, like, Oh, I'm going to hold it in too. And just be like, my goodness, you're getting into the yellow. Like, whew. And even a break can be something a few minutes or it can be like, I'm going to go have a coffee and I will be back. And then he, and just to add to that, he also makes sure I get breaks. So like there's certain times that are high stress for him that I usually like plow through, but there are definitely times, plenty of times when Mike is feeling like, oh, this is a good time. And I take plenty of breaks. So it's not just like one person just, you know, in charge of everything. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, finding that balance and honoring each other's authenticity and needs, all of that. Um, so thanks. I'm glad Boston's you guys came back on because we have some questions for for both the couples. So anyone jump in and answer. Um, someone said, how does the past intersect with your present work? In other words, do you work to understand your past history and tie that to the present? Or do you focus on your current state and how you can manage daily living better through tips and strategies? Because I, I can I can take a stab at that. So that's a really good question. Um, I think I am more towards tips and strategies for to kind of keep me present and kind of so I'm thinking more like I, I mean, although I do spend some time like retrospectively trying to figure out like uh, or reflecting on, you know, how things have turned out for me and maybe they would have turned out differently. I'm really about like I find strategies and working and working on strategies and uh you know, just trying to implement implement solutions. Uh, it's kind of fun in a way. So I get that that gives me more. Um, I get a lot of enjoyment out of that part. So I focus more on that. I would say. Anyone else? Wanna... Uh, for me, I would say similar. The tips and the strategies is really like your ground game. So you know you're going to be in that regularly. Um, I've done both, like the couples coaching or counseling and then also individual therapy and both is a different thing so individual might be like oh why do you feel like a burden when you're like asking for something that you need so you're like oh well this job and this job or whatever so there's different ways to kind of approach it kind of looking what your need to accomplish um it's it's different doing it as a couple i'll say than as an individual in some ways i would say it's more helpful what is more helpful uh, doing it together. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. You're like, see, see how wonderful they are. I think both are great. Like, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. very beneficial for Mike to have both his own counselor um, because he has anxiety and previously had depression. So it's very helpful for him to have both. And I also have both. And I find it very helpful because it's nice knowing that we don't have to be each other's like therapist. Like, it's like, okay, great. You can talk about that with your person and definitely come back to me with any helpful tips you found or things I can help with that. So anyway. Thanks. 
Um, we'll do a couple other questions and then we'll let everyone go because I know it's getting late. Um, but we had a question come in a while ago and I thought this would be a really nice question for our couples. Although Cheryl, Stephanie, you're welcome to jump in. Um, someone said, um, I'm the ND partner. How can I show more kindness and support in my relationship? So I would have previously been like, ah, oh, I'm going to brainstorm I'm going to research all this stuff. But I, I would just be like, I would ask Anne-Marie and then kind of be like, here, you probably need some time to think through it. You're, you would ask me kind of what I need. Yeah. Cause I would research all this stuff. Like, for example, you really like experiences. So I'd be like, you know, get this, get that. And I'd be like, it's not really your thing. It's kind of like shopping for Christmas. My family's always been like, tell me what you want and then I'll give it to you. <laughs> okay got it so you're saying what's helped you is asking me what I would like then you get what you actually I agree. want yeah I 100 that agree personally or yes he does that and that's very helpful instead of um yeah I, I'll tell him I'm well I'm, but that that works for me because I'm a very direct communicator but yeah I do like that he wants to know what I need and then I can let him know yeah it's funny whereas like with my kids for example I'll be like what do you want? <laughs> yeah. And they're just like sucking your thumb, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's where I'm like, I do not know what to do with you. <laughs> I have another question for you that's sort of come up in different ways in the chat, but this is a question that we generated previously. Um, can you, um, oh, sorry. How can, sorry, I keep reading the wrong one. How have you communicated with your clinical provider and your spouse if something is not working in couples work? working sorry I don't I didn't hear what you said so I'm not sure if everyone else got to hear saying this is not working let's do something else and reminding I think reminding ourselves of the definition of insanity doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results okay this is not working what do we need to do differently so thank you. And and so it may be a little bit easier to do that with your partner because you're with them all the time. Have either of you guys had experience with your counselor or your couple, either couples have experience with a counselor feeling like, huh, this isn't quite working. How do I approach that with my counselor? Maybe it's the same answer. You just say, hey, this isn't working. Um, any any ways that you've been successful in doing that or ways that that's been really challenging? So we, yeah, I'd say so we're direct in our conversation Go ahead. Oh, okay. Oh, I was just going to say, um, I think for us, um, Mike will sometimes tell me after a session or before, like, hey, can this just not be all about me and what I need to fix or whatever? And that is totally fair. I have my own set of things that I'm working through. So that's a good reminder for me because I can be like, okay, let's tackle this and this and this. And he's like, okay, let's make sure to like talk about both of us, which is very helpful advice for me. Um, and then, and then we also with Cheryl, we'll just write up like, Hey, these are some challenges we had this week and maybe we'll prioritize them. We'd love to like kind of touch on these. And so then it's not actually fixing anything, but it's like, it's not saying like, Oh, our counselor needs to change something they're doing. It's more just saying, Hey, this is a priority for us to focus on this week. Can we touch on it? And then our counselor has been very like, you know, able to, um, address what we're hoping to address i was gonna say i wouldn't say anything and then i would just wait till it bothers me and i'd be like i'd be like hey like a week later i'd be like hey Anne Marie, we should talk about this <laughs> yeah 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 because he has a different communication style where he'll hold it in and then sometimes i'll have to like tease it out of him like okay what's up what are you feeling upset about and and then figure it out together and then i'll let let the person know if needed not just in, not, this isn't even related to counseling, but just in, in general, if there's something we need to address. But yeah. Thanks. I was just going to add real quick. I mean, I think that and Cheryl, you can comment on it too. Like, I think the difference with coaching, again, is like, I am your partner on this journey. It, I am, right? I'm here to kind of help you, guide you. If you need direct information, I will give that to you, right? Like, I want you to come and tell me what is working and not working. So I feel like, because it is hard to come to a therapist regardless and say, oh, like, I'm not really connecting or this isn't working for me. So I feel like it's our job to make it comfortable 
for our clients to be really open and have that back and forth conversation. And it's also modeling, right? It's modeling conflict resolution. It's modeling how to share things that are uncomfortable. So it's okay to be uncomfortable, right? Mm -hmm. And it's okay to say things that aren't easy to say. You don't want to hurt somebody's feelings, but if it's coming from the right place and that trust is established, I I'm a believer that anything, anything can be said. Stephanie, I think that's a great point. Um, you know, I always talk to my patients, whether it's in couples work or individual, I always say, I may be an expert in, in autism spectrum disorder. You're an expert in yourself, in your lived experience, in your life, in your relationship. I'm not here and you're here. We're both here. We're working together as a team. And I think that's really key um, for any clinicians who are on this call to keep in your mind always um, is that we are working as a team um, with, with our couples, with our clients, with our patients, whatever we, we call them. Um, we, we may have some knowledge that is really helpful to impart on them, but we are also constantly learning from our couples and from our patients about, about what they bring into the session and kind of learning and growing together. Um, so I think that's a really great point, Stephanie. Um, I'm going to try to wrap up by 745, but I have one more question for our couples because I think this is really um, interesting. We've talked a lot about couples counseling or coaching tonight, um, but I'm curious um, what other supports have been helpful besides couples work, besides the, the kind of in-session couples work, and also, um, you know, maybe a part of that, have you gotten support from family and friends and how have you navigated talking about neurodiversity within your communities? I can say, uh, so we're also part of a um, neurodiverse group session. That's been really great because a lot of other couples, you get to see how they do things. So I guess that's, that. I mean, I get a lot out of the group therapy. So, um, so that's one thing. Uh, I'm trying to think what, what the other parts of the question. So family not so that's a that's a really interesting question i mean i haven't really expressed to my family my immediate family i say so and i say this is this is my immediate family but like parents and stuff like that so i'm still trying to uh i'm still kind of dealing with that and trying to figure out exactly how i'm going to uh address it with them so i haven't got that quite figured out yet but that's me um, one thing that's been helpful for us having kids is we do, we, um, in addition to all these things we already mentioned, we also do PCIT, which is parent-child interaction therapy. And so um, that has been helpful with us, with um, the kids, particularly with some of the social dynamics that were challenging. This is going to sound hilarious, but the best part is you actually wear like your earbud and they observe you playing with your kid and then... So you do with certain skills, like I wrote a whole NPR on this thing. Like, I mean, pediatricians were like, this is the easiest thing I've ever heard in my life. And they're like, wow, A, it was hard to learn. And B, the results are amazing. Yeah. So we don't have to go too in depth, but yeah. The stress level is gone. Like, Yeah, that it's definitely helped. It's now that our kids are old enough to do it, the kid has to be at like at least two. Um, but that's been very helpful navigating. I mean, we're kind of of the mindset where, we want to get as much support as we can. We we went from Push going, <laughs> I don't know what the button, button is. Okay, <laughs> okay. Launch um, a launch button, okay. Um, we went from basically trying to do things on our own and I in general can have a tough time asking for help. <clears throat> we went from that to like, oh, we'll just figure it out on our own to now we're like, any help, especially related to this this area it's we are taking interest. it yeah it is like my special interest so we um and also we both um, take medicine for our anxiety which definitely helps keep it in check game changer and it, we had to, both had to try a few different ones yeah. to find the right one um but then also did you want to add anything about that before yeah. i talk about family yeah okay. i have uh this is like a great one i have like a ranked relaxation where it was like well what energies deplete my what depletes my energy the most, what restores it the most. And then I have like a list that's saved on my smartphone. So especially if I'm like, I'm going to be in a stressful situation or like, you know, a t around a ton of people or something that's like, okay, I'm going to need to recharge. And so like the most relaxing for me is actually sitting in a hammock. I'm like, wow. And then, and don't, 
I don't tell who it is, but I even like ranked my friends by relaxation level. So I know like if I'm like, crap, I'm up a creek, I'm like, okay, call so and so. Or if I'm like, ah, uh, you know, whatever, I'll see that person later. Okay. <laughs> um it and- really helps because when you're yeah. kind of like when you're not in a great mood, you're like, whoa, oh, totally. what makes me feel better? Yeah, and that was a strategy Cheryl taught you. Yeah. It's like totally. putting the stuff in your pantry. Yeah. So you don't have junk food and you're like, okay. Yeah, totally. And then regarding families, so um that actually has been um a joy for us. Um, I'm like a very direct communicator. So <laughs> so for me, I like prefer to just be open about things. Like it's harder for me to just try to like keep a secret, like, oh, we're really struggling over here. Hopefully nobody notices. <laughs> but like for me, it's just like, hey, and I'm also very confident in what our situation is. It's like I have anxiety, he's neurodiverse, he also has anxiety. Like I, I don't need to hide anything here. And and so more it's just on, hey. You know, this is what we're going through right now, but we're getting help. And it's been a great experience for us. I know that's for many people, that's not going to be a good option because their family might have a stigma about it. Um, For my family, I mean, for our family, they have been very supportive and they just want to see us getting, you know, support. Um, so yeah, for us, it was like just a relief to talk about it because for a while we did try to just, you know, oh, let's just keep this private or whatever. But now it's just like, mm, we actually might be able to help some people by being open and honest and vulnerable in that. And it just feels more natural than just just trying to like, quick mic, pretend that we're totally normal. Like, it's just not- You can only hold it in for some Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's just been kind of a joy. And also it's- actually a relief I know for my family because I think they could see us struggling in different areas and it's a relief for them to know like oh okay I can kind of understand why these struggles are happening now because of neurodiversity because of anxiety and you're getting help for it so like when when like it's yeah so that's that's for us I know everybody's situation is totally different I saw just one thing and then um so I saw a a really good question about cost here so I noticed that there was multiple options. Um, like there's group coaching and counseling that's super cheap. There's stuff that's covered through insurance, but that's pretty hard to find. I had um, like if your company or your insurance has an employee assistance program, you can say find me someone that has this specific experience. It's like my therapist. I would have never been able to find on my own, but the company was like, oh, here's a person five miles from you that takes insurance and they're free. I'm like, heck yeah. Let's do that. And then we spent the money out of pocket. Like I originally did not want to spend the money out of pocket. I was like, no, I'd rather worth every X, Y, and Z. I mean, we have seen others crash and burn. And this is like no, I mean others who didn't want to get help. Basically, for us, if you can swing it and this is like these are your challenges, just go with one of these wonderful counselors here. Because like it's just, I mean, we we have we have friends that you know, they didn't want to spend any money on counseling. And then, you know, now they're spending a lot of money on a divorce. So it's like, just spend the money on good counseling and like help your marriage. It's worth every penny. Anyway, that's my plug. (laughs) Yeah. I would also say, um, just kind of ask, you know, there's, there's oftentimes options for sliding scale. There's oftentimes, um, therapists who are out of network will provide a super bill. You'd be surprised sometimes what your insurance will cover even for out of network. So kind of try to think outside of the box if you're looking for a clinician um, and and don't be shy to, to tell your clinician, hey, I'm, or tell someone who, whoever you reach on the phone, hey, I'm really struggling. We need support. We need a low cost option. Um, and, and hopefully they can kind of provide a little bit of guidance while you're navigating that. Um, all right. There are so many, so many fabulous questions. Um, there's one last question that I just wanted to get to just because I think it, it might, might be a, a, a quick answer, but meaningful to people who are thinking like, how is neurodiverse couples work different from, uh, neurotypical couples counseling. So the question was about, um, time, like length of time in counseling. And does that seem to be different? Is it like a 12 weeks course? Do we imagine that couples are in couples work with a clinician for a year or two years? 
um, just kind of how how is that different or is it different from traditional couples work? Um, I can start off real quick. I mean, I think for me, I know other coaches who have packages, right? So it's like six sessions. Um, I'm more comfortable working session to session because sometimes it is just a consult. Like sometimes somebody just has information and questions and we'll just talk for 90 minutes, right? And we'll just, I'll answer questions as best I can or provide information and resources. And then I have other clients that I may work with for like four to six weeks and then things start to feel better. And then it's, you know, we spread out the time. So it really is so individual. Um, I don't know, Cheryl, if you have any thing to add to that, but it it is like psychotherapy is so much different, right? Than really focused oriented like goals like what's going on what do you need help with let's figure this out together um it's it is yeah I think I'd just pick up where you left off with let's figure it out together there's a famous statement by Stephen Shore if you meet one person with autism you've met one person with autism the same thing is true for couples if you sometimes people will say well just give me a tip this is what's going on tell me what to do well you can't because there's so many other variables you know maybe the challenge for the neurodivergent partner is not the same challenge um it's going to be a very different answer so if you're working with one couple you're going to take them where they are but if you if you continually you know uh support a couple's goals i usually like to say it takes at least four to six sessions to get any kind of traction and connection maybe you start out more intensively or maybe you start out meeting once every few weeks and then and then see if the pace needs to change. But um, sometimes I'll work with couples more intensively and then they'll reach a, a plateau, a place where they're just really comfortable and then something will happen and they'll come back um, to work on another problem or another situation that's arisen, um, life changes, things like that. Sometimes finances dictate how often you meet. Um, and, you know, and we try to be as flexible as possible to meet the most people where they are and, and give them what they need to be able to move forward. All right. Well, thank you so much. I want to thank um, Cheryl and Stephanie um, for providing us with amazing uh, information um, about kind of the work that, that you do, that we do, um, and thank our couples for being here, for being vulnerable. There were so many folks in the chat who were just in awe of your vulnerability and of your willingness to be here. And um, we really thank you for that. I think it's really um, meaningful to the community and um, we are, we're just so grateful for you. We're grateful for all the questions. I know we didn't get to all of them. Um, I put my email in the chat. I know Stephanie and Cheryl's emails are also in the chat. Um, so you are welcome to reach out to us if you have further questions or questions that you asked tonight that we didn't get to um, or looking for resources. Um, AANE is also um, has a great website with lots of resources for um, couples, neurodiverse couples, counselors, and um, 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 cu couples clinicians. So you can check that out as well. Um, thank you all for being here. I don't know, Susan, if you want to close it out in any other way, but we're we're grateful for everyone on on the panel and and everyone here um, who participated in this in this conversation. Thank you, Amanda. I, I echo your gratitude for everybody on the panel and in the chat as well. And I put a plug into the chat that our next panel session is going to be next month on financial planning and special needs trust. And so again, another free webinar, the Atlanta Autism Consortium is going to be offering for anybody who wants to register. We'll be advertising that shortly. So thank you everyone for your time, for your expertise and your experiences. And we will see you next month, hopefully.